Hey all, Ed here, community lead at Persona, and I'm super excited with this episode. I'm talking to Christina Rea. She's a New Yorker attorney, and she's great at a lot of things compliance related. She has been a chief of compliance at many big companies. She has a lot of experience in coming from like this, you know, solicitor law world into fintech, and now dipping her toes into like the crypto world, Web3. So we spoke about a lot of things. We spoke about DeSci, which is decentralized science. We spoke about DeFi, decentralized finance, the treasury reports, a couple of things that are like better technical, but if I understood, I'm pretty sure you will understand as well because I'm not that technical in this. Uh, and she's just a great person. She's easy to talk to. We can get into like any conversations and just make it flow nicely. So Christina, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's awesome to, to see someone if you're like your level of expertise. I already follow you. I mean, I've been seeing like a lot of your amazing content that you share on LinkedIn. So I'm a little bit biased, but I'd love to hear from you. You know, who is Christina? Maybe if you should share a little bit about your story. Uh, how do you end up in the world of, you know, compliance, being like a CCO? Uh, but yeah, I mean, take it away. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me here. Um, it's really great to uh, be part of this. Um, yeah. So I'm Christina Ray. I'm the CEO of, of Raycor Consulting. And how did I get into compliance? That's a great question. So I graduated law school in the thick of the uh, financial recession back in 2009. And I thought I was going to be doing family law and divorce law. And the recession sort of wiped out the plans of a lot of my uh, my law school colleagues. You know, we had to sort of pivot and figure out what to be doing uh, to get paychecks. So interestingly enough, my background was actually in, in finance before I went to law school. A lot of people, you know, major in, in English or poli sci, but uh, I worked as a financial analyst for a little while. So when I was pivoting and trying to figure out, you know, okay, well, what do I do now? Um, you know, obviously the financial crisis was was heavy on everyone's mind. And I started seeing some roles in compliance. Um, I actually started off in mortgage compliance. So the big banks were, were being sued for not following proper protocols and testing on, um, you know, lending to, to mortgage borrowers. And from there, I pivoted into anti-money laundering because in 2011, 2012, that was an area that was heating up substantially and they the, they couldn't hire fast enough. I mean, they were hiring ex-FBI agents, police officers, law degrees, anyone with any sort of parallel experience. So I, I made the pivot over to financial crimes compliance and I thought that seemed very fitting, given that, you know, financial uh, crises had sort of you know, inhibited my ability to get a job out of law school. So it seemed fitting to go in and sort of try to rectify the problem from the, the compliance side. Um, yeah, so so that's how I got into compliance. And I've, uh, I've been here, it's what, 2023. So yeah, longer than 10 years at this point, it goes fast. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. I mean, it's not a common thing to have a background in both law and finance, right? I mean, that's a unique skill set. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, you know, when I was majoring in, in finance in undergrad, the initial thought was to, you know, maybe be a stockbroker. Uh, I'm going to throw some names out there people might not recognize anymore, like Lehman Brothers and Smith Barney. Like, I remember interviewing at these places way back when. Um, but my heart wasn't really in it, you know, making money from that side. I really did always want to be a lawyer. So I figured, well, having the finance degree is, is never going to hurt. You know, I'm going to go to law school and I'm going to totally pivot and do something different. And I'm a firm believer that things sort of work out the way they're supposed to. So, you know, having both those backgrounds and being able to combine them into one career path and then being able to extrapolate that even beyond into the world of tech and fintech and, and crypto and, and just the explosion of new terms now has been incredibly interesting. And never in a million years did I think I would be helping regulate things like, you know, NFTs or, you know, all different sorts of, you know, uh, asset tokens out there. Like it's, it's just been a wild ride. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that. And as you're talking, I'm thinking exactly like it, it's just so many more things coming up now. And uh, I know we were talking about AI earlier, and that's definitely one. But like as you mentioned, NFTs, the Web three world on itself is is a whole new thing, and and 
I yeah. mean, you have that background, but I don't think they teach you any of that, right? I mean, they probably haven't taught you any of that. So how did you learn about these things and being, you know, knowing this industry at all? Honestly, you know, I really believe a lot of it is is self-taught, you know? So when I, when I started in compliance and in anti-money laundering and KYC, I was working for some of the big banks, which is where pretty much, you know, everybody kind of got their feet wet. You go in, you learn about risk assessments, you learn about transaction monitoring, you know, you learn all like the basics of, of operational compliance. And then I left the banking world. I was getting frustrated because you're kind of siloed when you're in the banks. You know, if you're doing transaction monitoring, it's kind of difficult to make the jump into sanctions. You know, you're, you, you know, you want to learn different stuff, but you don't really get a lot of opportunity to because everything is so quantified, you know, like how many alerts are you closing a day? And I was like, okay, this isn't really for me. I want to, you know, be making a difference, not just closing cases every day. So um, I went to a startup, it was a reg tech startup and um, you know, they, they've since folded, but I knew somebody that knew somebody that worked there and they wanted somebody with my kind of experience because they were building out a platform that was meant to, to help banks, you know, streamline their, their AML and KYC processes using smart data. And I knew nothing about any of this. I mean, I was, I felt like I was a chicken with my head cut off. I was running around trying to figure out, you know, what is, what does a business analyst do? What is a use case? You know, what is, what is, you know, a wireframe, all this stuff. And there was a guy at that company who was so nice to me. He was so patient. He explained everything. And then he started explaining to me what blockchain was. And then I started doing some reading and I was reading about Bitcoin and then I was reading about different, you know, exchanges. This is probably around like 2015, 2016. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm like, okay, you know, this might be a world I want to get into. And the best way to do it was just to, you know, digest as much information as I could. I mean, I was taking like really small projects. I was, you know, helping companies that were offering ICOs, try to figure out if they were, you know, a security or a utility token. I mean, I was doing soup to nuts, everything. And I was teaching myself as I went, I was reading all this literature about MSBs and how they're regulated. Um, and then I just got, you know, I, I got a break again. Networking is, is a big deal uh, in, in any industry, but especially in this industry, it's been a lot about, you know, who I've known. And in 2019, I was, you know, given the opportunity to be the, the chief compliance officer of uh, another startup that was uh, trying to create their own digital asset exchange. So, yeah, a lot of, lot of self-taught stuff and just, you know, every webinar I could attend, every piece of guidance I could read, just scribbling notes and, and trying to make it all make sense. It is incredibly complicated because, you know, the industry is just, it's constantly changing. So the minute I think I have a handle on, you know, a new type of technology, something new is coming down the road, some new acronym, some new, um, you know, some new protocol, some new application of things. And then, you know, the, the people creating these apps and this technology are incredibly smart. They're way smarter than I am. But, you know, trying to kind of be the liaison between them, the regulators, and all the people within a company, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of like being a counselor and intermediary, being a compliance officer, because you're sort of trying to, you know, teach, uh, you know, people in the industry, okay, this is what you need to take into consideration to have uh, a risk-based approach. You know, that's, that's definitely the big term. But then, I mean, I've had CEOs challenge me, like, what does risk mean? What does approach mean? What does based mean? I mean, just what is, what is, what is the procedure? Like, 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 you know, philosophically, what exactly is a procedure document? I mean, you wouldn't believe the ways in which I've been challenged. I feel like, you know, I should have gone to MIT just to be able to, to work in compliance. And, you know, somebody, somebody that I used to work with just gave me the best piece of advice. He's like, you do the best you can to advise. You let them know of all the risks. And then at the end of the day, you have to let the business, you know, do what the business is, is going to do. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the ethos I take with me. And I, I try to work with, you know, business owners and, and tech people to say, I understand, you know, your goal is bottom line results. My goal is making sure that we're compliant. How do we work together to make sure that we're, you know, meeting the spirit of the law, that we're following, you know, industry best practices so that if you are audited, you know, you're showcasing that you're doing everything, you're taking risks into account. But, you know, where where can we maybe, you know, make this more efficient and, you know, where, where the guidance, you know, maybe has some gaps, where can we take this in a different direction? So, I mean, it's every day is something different in my world. Yeah. 
That's amazing. I mean, I'm super curious because, as you said, I mean, it's not only super complicated, but I think companies like that, they will try to always bend the laws and compliance. But, you know, like not in a bad way, but I mean, they have to challenge things because they're trying something completely new in an unregulated world. So they have to come up with things and then you're there like to kind of like be their support. You're like, okay, this is kind of going too far. Let's control this. So there's, as you said, there's a challenge on that. And making things happen but do you have any interesting learnings you had or any interesting story from like the world of chief compliance in like crypto web3 or the world of like you know the unregulated <laughs> yeah i mean you know working for for like a centralized you know crypto exchange is a little bit easier because it's kind of you know been cut and dry in the moment you know most crypto exchanges are classified as money service businesses and so there's really like a lot of black letter law around that, you know, exactly what information they need to collect on their users. Once they have that and the users are transacting, what they need to be, you know, looking for, what the red flags are. I've still been challenged. Like I said, probably one of the most interesting challenges I had, I was, I was flown out uh, to California at one point for a meeting um, with a company and, you know, I just, I just spent an hour debating like what a procedure document actually is because I, I was probably talking about like KYC procedures and the guy I was talking to again, just incredibly smart. I mean, I, I, I talked to some of the smartest people when it comes to like product managers and engineers and data scientists, I mean, way above and beyond, you know, they have so much more, you know, analytical ability than I do. And I was just sitting there like fascinated thinking, you know, I'm being paid hourly and, and I'm being asked to, to discuss the philosophy of what a procedure document is. And I was like, you know, in a way, this is actually kind of cool because when I left the banks, I wanted to get away from, you know, doing nothing but closing cases every day. So I could choose to sit here and, and you know, be sort of frustrated by this, or I could choose to look at this as an opportunity to really expand, you know, my mindset and my way of thinking and, you know, figure out, okay, like how do we in 20, I think this was 2021 at the time. Um, how do we define a procedure document in, in 2021? Um, that was definitely pretty interesting. I, I had one client at one point ask me how I know that stocks and securities are, are even real, you know, beyond just a stock certificate or, or you know, logging into your, you know, your brokerage account. How, how do we know this is something real? And I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I should have shown up for my philosophy class in, in college a little bit more. Um, those are probably some of the more the more interesting stories. Um, and then, uh, you know, in, in, in the world of, of DeFi, decentralized, oh, man, I mean, I just every like, again, every time I think I have a handle on what's going on over there, I'm, I'm learning something new. They're, they're figuring out new ways to, you know, uh, try to tell me that just having transaction on the blockchain is enough. You don't need to collect KYC information. It's definitely a wild west, like you said. Yeah, that's amazing. And do you feel that this was a, a spark for you to start your own business to think about, I want to do this more, like and be like on this strategic and thinking side than operational one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, you know, doing the operational stuff is, is old hat at this point. And it's just one of those things, you know, it's part and parcel of what I do. So absolutely, I'm going to go into, you know, client engagements and have to do operational work because that's the meat and potatoes of this stuff. But in, you know, really finally having the the courage to, to go off and start my own business, it really just cause does come down to, you know, I want to learn. I want to kind of, you know, do things on, on my own schedule and my own pace, you know, working for some of the, the big companies I've worked for have been absolutely tremendous learning opportunities. And even the people in those companies that maybe I had some friction with, I'm still incredibly grateful to them for the opportunity to learn, you know, just the opportunity to come in and, you know, see how like a, a big company runs. But yeah, you know, like I, I don't necessarily want to put all my eggs in one basket all the time. You know, crypto has maybe kind of been my bread and butter over the past few years. But I like having the ability to learn more about what's going on, you know, in, in the world of, of fintech and even beyond fintech, you know, just from like a regulatory standpoint. You know, I'm, I'm based in New York City and uh, cannabis is a huge deal now because you can apply for a license and open up shop and you know legally sell uh, recreational marijuana but in doing that there's a whole world of compliance around that too you have to get the license you have to follow different compliance metrics you know issued by the office of, of cannabis management um, and then in terms of just finding investors you know investors 
they don't even know what they need in terms of due diligence. So we're all sort of figuring that out. And then when it comes to something like like banking cannabis, I mean, there's there's so you know, I don't want to say there's there's few, but there's not that many banks, you know, in the U.S. that are willing to onboard, um, you know, cannabis based businesses. So helping them who, who do want to take that risk on figure out, OK, what kind of program do we need to have in place? I like having the ability to, to dive into all of this type of stuff and really be a true compliance officer beyond somebody that logs in every day, just does, you know, KYC and transaction monitoring alerts, somebody that, you know, really looks at the space holistically in terms of all the different, you know, products and offerings out there, but then all the different, you know, areas of compliance beyond, like I said, just sort of KYC transaction monitoring. You know, one thing I try to, to educate clients on is if you're having a fulsome compliance program, you need to take many things into consideration, like vendor management, you know, business continuity policy, you know, uh, info security, all sorts of stuff. Like you can't just be, you know, knowing your customer and um, and sanctions, even though those are hugely important parts. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it, it's it's such a great topic. Uh, you did actually, I mean, I kind of follow you as I mentioned, and I saw that you shared something. We're talking about DeFi slightly. And the Treasury released this like report on the new assessment, right, for DeFi. And yeah. I saw like your notes there, but I know that you have a, a strong uh, opinion there and a strong feel there. So how do you believe that this is going to change, you know, uh, and the platforms and how they handle information with all of these new rules coming in? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, DeFi is such an interesting space. I mean, talk about the Wild West. Um, having worked with a few people in DeFi, uh, there's sort of this sense that, you know, de, you know decentralized, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, crypto exchanges or lending, borrowing, you know, like, like whatever's going on in DeFi, there's been almost this, you know, this tone of like, we're, we don't have to have, you know, BSA, AML protocols in place. And, um, you know, I've, I've, I've tried to have conversations going back to, you know, being, being an advisor who advises on risk of telling them, well, you know, maybe you're not on regulatory radar at the moment because there's so much going on in the space, but it's coming, you know, like just by virtue of the fact that you're claiming to be decentralized doesn't necessarily mean that you're not still engaging in, in typical activity that would be covered under, you know, federal and state rules and regulations. So, you know, that was kind of the first half of my year last year. And, uh, you know, I, I, I advised as best I could and I was sort of, you know, poo-pooed off. And then when the Treasury released their risk assessment, I was reading through it and, and I was laughing um, because the wording is just... It's kind of it's kind of harsh, and you know it's it's kind of exactly what I was telling clients in the past. You know, they're saying just because you're calling yourself decentralized doesn't necessarily mean anything if you're offering you know products and services that would fall under you know the definition of like a, a covered financial institution under the Bank Secrecy Act. You still have to abide by these laws. You know, it doesn't really matter if you're decentralized or not. If you're you know allowing people to exchange currency in some form or fashion you're probably going to be classified as a money service business. Now, they haven't issued guidance yet, you know, to exactly define what all, you know, what all DeFi categories, you know, mean. They sort of say, based on facts and circumstances, you could be considered a covered institution that, you know, has to abide by these laws. So I think at the moment, they're sort of leaving it up to the institutions and their lawyers and compliance officers to do the test to figure out how would we be qualified. But I'm sure as time goes on, they're going to issue more and more guidance, sort of like they did with virtual asset service providers. You know, this is covered. This is not covered. It's just interesting to me because I'm like DeFi sort of moves at an even faster speed. So, you know, are, are the regulators going to be able to keep up with how to classify them? In the risk assessment itself, you know, I was kind of having flashbacks to the, the days of ICOs. Like just because you're calling yourself one thing doesn't mean that's how, you know, you would be classified. Like if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's, it's probably a duck. And in terms of like actual crackdown on, on DeFi, I think that's inevitable. In the guidance, you know, they talk about whether you're regulated by the CFTC, FinCEN, or SEC. They don't think that there's insufficient regulatory clarity 
around how to define your, your business and, and, and who would, you know, what your regulatory obligations are. They, they say specifically in the guidance, we, we think we've made it pretty clear that, you know, automation of certain functions through, through smart contracts and protocols and code doesn't affect your, um, your obligations, your compliance obligations. So if you go through the guidance and read it, it talks about what the gaps are and, and, and what they're hoping to do as time goes on. And, there, and there's no real set timeline but sad if the uh, Financial Action Task Force issued guidance in, in 2021 that gave a very basic owner-operator test to determine if a DeFi project is uh, considered a VASP or not. And now we've got this risk assessment. My best advice to anybody in DeFi is you don't want to be one of the, the first use cases, uh, you know, to be fined, you know, or, or, or to be brought down, especially if you're operating um, a, a legal business like DeFi. The, the risk assessment talks about Tornado Cash and Renbridge and, and the, the names we all know. But if you're actually operating a legitimate business, my advice is get on board with compliance uh, sooner than later, you know, get the right people in place to figure out if you would be a covered financial institution and then where do we take that in terms of your compliance obligations yeah and i have so many questions i'm probably going to ask the, the dumb questions but why not right what's a vasp oh sorry that virtual asset service provider so there's there's like a million terms i think <laughs> um I think one of the blockchain protocol companies like Chainalysis or, or Elliptic, they issued like a card game where it has all the terms and, and, you know, what they all, all the acronyms and what they mean. But yeah, basically just, you know, like a crypto exchange. Got it. Okay. So that that's good to know. And what's a, a FAT? Is it like the financial organization? What's, oh, is it? Yeah. Financial Action Task Force is, is like a global watchdog for, for compliance. Oh. So, you know, in, in America, we have the Bank Secrecy Act, we have the Patriot Act, we have, you know, the mm -hmm. Money laundering control act we have all our various you know federal regulations every country every region has their own finance compliance authority you know in the uk it's the the fca singapore it's like the the monetary something agency but then on a global level because there isn't really a, a global standard for compliance we have certain committees and and, and watchdog groups that try to issue like global guidance that everybody should be following. And kind of the gold standard for that is the Financial Action Task Force. So they're, I think they're the ones that actually coined the, the term risk-based approach. Because um, you hear that term tossed around a lot in the compliance world and taking it back to the beginning, like where was it codified as it were, it's not really mentioned in, in laws. It was more so guidance. And now it's just become adopted as best practice. And even the regulators will go in and, and look for specifically risk-based approach. It's now in like, um, it's in the exam manuals, even if it's not actually in specific laws itself. So uh, Financial Action Task Force or FATF, they issue guidance. Either they expect people to sit up and pay attention. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And you mentioned that there's no definitive timeline for when this should take place. But do you have a, I mean, a lot of founders are in the DeFi space and not using Persona. Any recommendations for them should just keep track on, on this or try and be as compliant as possible as soon as possible? What is as a, as a compliance officer, my advice is, you know, the sooner the better. So if this yeah. is on your radar and you, you know, have the capability to start having conversations with whomever your legal team is, your compliance officer, your compliance tech provider, better to start having the conversation now and say, okay, what does an outline and a framework look like? And and do a roadmap. That's something I recommend to clients. You don't, you don't have to have every single thing in place immediately. I mean, some things you do, like sanctions, regardless if you're classified as a financial institution or not, you know, if you're a US entity or person, you still need to run sanction searches. So the bare minimum have that going for you. But in terms of a roadmap, like what can you do over the next three months? What can you do over the next six months? How much money is it going to take? What sort of resources are you going to need? Once you stand up a program, how do you test it? How do you audit it? Uh, things like that. So that way it doesn't feel like you're needing to put everything in place immediately. And when you sort of break it down and have a roadmap, even just showing regulators you're putting in good faith efforts to stand up a compliance program can go a long way. I really appreciate this. And I 100% vouch that because I remember it's unrelated, but related when GDPR was becoming a thing in Europe, I had to like out of the blue start to learn. And I was like, I have no idea, I'm not in compliance, I'm not in law or anything. But uh, uh, to your point, I think there's a mix of 
that's when I think tech mixes with like compliance, right? Because you need to know what do you need to change in your product and how you configure things, how you, I don't know, store data, how you make that data available. And that's like product changes, right? It's not compliance. It's like following the compliance advice, you have to do that in the product. So that changes your backlog. It changes your next deliverables, how your, I don't know, tables are and databases are working and all of that. So it's it, it may sound small initially, but then as you start to open that kind of warms you're like, oh my God, that's a lot of things that I have to change here. So you're absolutely right. I think the earlier, the more you can like assess, okay, what's my level of effort to deliver this and, and start doing it, right? I mean, really good advice. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're exactly right, especially if you're a company that has multiple offices globally, there's going to be different kinds of standards and you bringing up, you know, privacy and GDPR is, is excellent and goes back to my point that compliance isn't just, you know, AML, KYC. It's, it's everything. It's having legal and compliance working together to have the right privacy notices. Um, even within the U.S., certain states have different privacy laws. If you go into any sort of website and you look under the privacy notice terms of service, you're going to see um, kind of the general notice. And then California's got their own stuff and uh, Europe's got their own stuff. So sort of figuring out, having the right people in place to help you figure out, you know, okay, these are all the components. What can we work on now? What can, you know, what, what can we knock out? What's, what's the priority in terms of making stuff we need to make sure we have in place immediately? And then in terms of, you know, continuing to build out risk-based tiering clients or developing smart data to, to hone in on your red flags, that can be continued to be built out over time goes on. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you love a lot of different things. And I, uh, the other thing that we mentioned, we we're talking about this in the community. I think you raised this and I was like, wow, this is great. And I started to do my research and I was like, that's like a pretty interesting new concept the DSI or decentralized science. And I know you, again, you, you wrote about this, but you also shared this in our persona community. Uh, I'd love to get your take. I mean, on where you see this going, what potential challenges, maybe giving like an overview of like what DSI actually means and what have you seen so far or anything interesting that you, you observed? Yeah, this is this is a fascinating area to me. I mean, this is getting a little bit off the track of compliance, but it's still within, you know, the realm of, of tech and, and what tech capabilities are. I subscribe to a number of like morning sub stacks, you know, those newsletters you get in your, your inbox every day that talk about like the news of the day or, you know, cool concepts. And I saw one that was talking about DSI or decentralized science. And I just, again, I was like, oh man, are we putting decent, decentralized in front of everything now? But then I started reading through it. And just a disclaimer, this is not my area of expertise, but just a cool thing to do some reading about. It's a, it's a movement that's aiming to build like public infrastructure for a lot of the pain points that the scientific community faces. And, and I'm not a scientist. I, I know a few people in the community, but things like funding, and uh, IP, just getting like credit for your work, disseminating scientific knowledge. There's a lot of roadblocks in place. I was doing a little bit of reading about how like the publishing industry, you know, is really a roadblock for scientists in, in terms of, you know, getting getting their work out there or getting it reviewed. Lots of stuff gets gets stuck. These, these private companies fund research. And so the scientists have to sort of go where the money is. And they have to spend a lot of time writing grant proposals instead of actually doing scientific research. And, you know, when I was reading about DSI, the goal is, is to be able to use Web3 and smart contracts and blockchain to eliminate some of, of these roadblocks. And, and one of the things I thought was the coolest was in terms of funding, instead of just relying on one or two companies to, to fund your research and, and letting them have say and what you're researching, so maybe it's, you know, a little bit biased, which, you know, scientific research shouldn't be, um, you can almost sort of like crowdsource funding. Um, and there's like uh, incentives to do that. And, and then again, I'm still learning about this stuff myself. But I was like, wow, how cool that you could go in and contribute to, you know, valuable scientific research. So it's almost like, you know, the way I see it is like, kind of like a, a GoFundMe, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I was like, I think that's a really cool idea, um, you know, like being yeah. able to, to see what's going on, like what people are actually researching and being able to, to you know, contribute to that. You know, their, their goal is to sort of not keep things, you know, like hidden and, and, you know, like I'm working on this, I don't want anybody else to see it. But, you know, being able to have scientific information, you know, accessible to, to pretty much anyone. Yeah. And I think they're like offering... NFTs is a way to, to bring <laughs> yeah, 
I was reading one article. It was way beyond, you know, my, my, my understanding, but it was something about, you know, a drug company, um, you know, being able to, to offer a, an NFT as a way to, to raise money. And I guess if, if that's your world and that's your interest and in, in having that NFT and, and, you know, your money going towards valuable scientific research is your thing. I think that's incredibly cool. And then just, you know, the, the, the quote unquote perma web is, as I read in one of the articles, properties of blockchain, where they can, you know, store data and information forever and have it be able to access it from anywhere. You're guarding against uh, censorship, which is a, a big deal in their community as well. So, um, yeah, just the few articles I've read about it said it's, it's very much in its infancy. But I was just like, wow, what a what a world that could open up, you know, like getting all sorts of really necessary medical and, and climate change and, and, you know, all this really important and critical research. Yeah out you know out from being blocked by the typical like red tape like i, I love the sound of it i mean i'm 100 percent bullish on that i love this idea and as you were talking about it a lot of things came to my mind of like even if like as i said it's not compliance related but i think one of the things that we probably see a lot is that if you google any kind of disease or any like you have like a back pain you google it like cancer like some unvetted website it has a great seo or even like i don't know known websites with like huge seo will just pop up on the top and it's not a validated research or it's just someone coming up with like this article to just drive traffic and conversion into whatever so even thinking about like a decentralized you know share of like if you share that information i imagine this world of like i don't know an open api of, of scientific data that will then validate things that you're doing research for us you have like this source of truth that is validated across multiple sources and decentralized group of i don't know people in medicine and science and all of that it's just like creating this opportunity for first people getting access to real information and then just just like weird you know and i can necessarily through information about how to cure certain things or how certain symptoms could be one thing or the other i think that's one for sure and there's another one which kind of related to compliance, and I kind of wanted to touch on that, which is interesting. There's a guy that has the exact same name as I do, uh, and he's based in Brazil, and he treats water in a specific city. And he writes a lot of scientific articles and you know about his research and what is he doing in that city to treat water. And then suddenly I start to get a notification from this like educational academic website saying, uh, hey, is this you? And then it was my name. I was like, yeah, that's me. And I, I just clicked. And then suddenly I started to be attributed all for all his articles. And suddenly with no KYC, I suddenly became this guy. And then I was getting, you know, the credits for him. And I was like, oh no, I'm not writing about water. I'm not doing any research on water treatment. And then I, I dig a little bit more. I was like, oh, hold on. It's like this other dude. And he probably doesn't even know that he's being, you know, that I stole his credits. I mean, and not in a bad way, obviously it didn't steal anything, but yeah. I just went back to the website. I was like, this is not me. This is this other guy that has exactly the same name as I do. Yeah. And because it's a known website, I'm not gonna you know, mention this website because it's not the point, but it's essentially concerning, right? Because I mean, it, it could be, I could essentially start to throw stuff there that's not necessarily mm -hmm. true. It's just my own thoughts, but because I took the name, yeah. uh, maybe credited as like, a scientist in, in who knows things. So there's a KYC element in that, right? In, in like knowing who's actually submitting that information. Yeah, that's fascinating. I hadn't even considered that, you know, maybe, maybe we coin our own term. Um, so instead of know your customer in that regard, maybe it's know your scientist or, you know, know yeah. your know KYS. Your, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Know your um, know your submitter. I, I don't know. That's that's really that's really fascinating. KYC is you know uh, it, it, well, especially in the fi financial world, it's about knowing your customer. But there's a use case in in any sort of industry for identity verification at the bare minimum, and then following up and maybe doing some more due diligence to ensure that somebody is who they say they are. Um, I think AI will play a, a huge role in that. Certainly Persona, I know I've read about you guys, you know, having some cool use cases beyond just fintech. I, I think you were getting into the world of uh, online dating too, to verify users, yeah. which there can be a financial component of that as well in terms of like fraud and scams. But yeah, just sort of being able to help prevent fraud or people stealing identities for, for any real reason, whether it's money or, or stealing credit for something like 
yeah, there's a lot of use cases out there for for knowing who um, identity verification or potentially KYS. Now you're scientist. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love this term. And we could be talking for forever here. I think there's so many topics that you just have so much knowledge and I, need, I think you're just passionate about reading stuff. Uh, I'm curious to like, how did you find out about Persona? Because you mentioned that you obviously wrote a piece on Persona and you, you know us, you know what we do, but it's not like a thing that you like just go on a web and search and find like very quickly. Yeah. You probably have to be intentional to, to be able to find us. So I'm curious to, you know, how, how did you find us? Yeah, so I, I can't take the full credit. I was introduced to Persona, but it was it was uh, an, a long time ago. And when I say a long time ago in the world of, of FinTech and RagTech, I'm talking four years ago. So not that long ago, but okay. it, crypto fintech world that's a long time ago i was the the chief compliance officer for a company called velocity markets at the time and i was a startup crypto exchange virtual asset service provider and they were doing amazing things in terms of compliance like they were a dream to work with because when i came on board they said to me you know we know we need a, a program and policies and procedures and transaction monitoring and, and kyc and uh, one of the guys there who was like a super networker, he knew everybody. He was like the guy you wanted to be at a party with introducing you to people. He'd heard about Persona. And so, you know, your, your founder, Rick, uh, he was introduced to us and, and we were one of the, you know, I guess, first uh, clients of, of Persona and one of the beta testers for the identity verification tool. And I remember just being blown away because it was you know, user friendly. It was quick. Um, Rick and the team knew about what the pain points were, so it was really easy to implement. And then we just we we stayed in touch through the years. Um, so networking brought us together, and um, just having a, a great product and in, in place, and, and one that I definitely um, have enjoyed using myself. That's that's how I got to know Persona. That's awesome. I mean, it's I, I need to meet this person, this networker. <laughs> we did more of that. <laughs> that's so yeah. cool. It should be a job, like like super networker should be its own job. <laughs> right? Yeah. Know your networker. I, I mean, this is great. This is great. Um, I want to. I mean, obviously, like. As you said, like there's a lot here going on. We can be talking about this like forever. But mm -hmm. if people want to and like follow your work, maybe follow you, maybe get in touch with you to network with you, maybe get to know your work, and maybe even in who knows, uh, they will need like your expertise to to deploy compliance. Where can people find you? Yeah, I'm all over the place. So you can absolutely find me on on LinkedIn. Uh, my name is Christina Ray. The last name is spelled R E A. Um, I'm always posting, you know, stuff that that maybe I think is interesting. Um, that's not always related to to compliance, like we were talking about, but just in the world of, of tech and science, and you know, where where where's the future taking us? I can be found there. Um, I can be found on uh, Persona's uh, community Slack channel. Um, I'm always happy to jump in and, and answer a quick question or give a quick opinion. And also you can go to my, my website. So my, my company is, is Raycore Consulting. It's uh, R-A-Y-C-O-R consulting.com. Uh, you can send a, an email um, through the website that way. So yeah, we're, wherever works. That's awesome. I'll make sure to leave the links as well at uh, in our uh, publishing page. And uh, it's amazing. I mean, you have so much expertise and so much to talk about. It's always good to talk to you and hear your opinion. So thank you so much for your time, Christina. And yeah, I mean, I'll let you know when we're live because I make sure that, that people get to follow you and, and, you know, follow your work and things that you've been publishing, which is Perfect. great. And thank you so much for the time again. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This has been terrific. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Take Stay care. Well. Have a good Bye -bye. one. Hope you liked this episode. And if you would like to stay in touch with Christina, you can follow her in the links below. Make sure that you join our community on voicepersona.com slash community. We have a ton of new things coming up and I'm excited to have you there. So see you all and take care.